So for me, when I think about the purpose of creation, I think it is an opportunity to show how you you go through the world. It should be a reflection of the times that we're at. And then from that reflection of those times, it should be an extension of yourself and your lens and your perspectives. The way the photographers are able to see their own kinds of lens and they shoot their shots in very specific kind of ways. I think it's important for us to really start looking at creation as an opportunity to expand on the world that we came in, but also leave it a little bit more different from for when we leave as well. So yeah. Yeah. Um, my name is Marquise Richards, Marquise Davon, this American Negro, whatever you want to call me. I'm a podcaster. I'm an educator. I'm a creator. I was in theater. I was in dance. I did so many things in the art space, but for right now, I'm just um, an artist and activist. So, um, creation started early. Like even as a kid, I think that's something that's always been here. Cause I think growing up in the hood, you really Growing up a single parent household, there were I have four siblings, I'm in the middle of five. It is interesting because as our parents were working multiple jobs, our mom was working multiple jobs, it was like, all right, how do kids really figure out like, how does this world work, right? Um, so we see things first on video games, we see things in movies, we see things in cartoons, and we try to overall like recreate like what these things were so me and my siblings used to play these pretend games is what we called them and it was trying to take these fights from like so caliber or resident evil or final fantasy and try to like just make something out of um not having too much growing up so i think that's really where it started and then from there we just we had them play swords or we my mom didn't like the pretend guns but you know we had those too and stuff like that so i think that's really where imagination really starts because it started from a space of scarcity and i just kind of wanted to imagine this world that i was like oh this is really cool i want to grow up in this or oh this is cool i get to be like a fighter for a day or a mage for a day or some shit like that so that's really where it delved into a lot yeah most definitely it was always picking up these different roles that i wanted to get into and really wanting to embody somebody who wasn't on our reality i think that's really what it was at the end of the day it was who is this person and can I get out of this shitty situation I was in growing up? I think um, I was nervous. Um, so it started in the eighth grade. We did Once on this Island in middle school. And I was just like, I'm gonna try something different. Cool. <laughs> Didn't know too much about it. Not a good singer, had no rhythm. That I played my cello for the majority of time. So I was just like, oh, this is my thing. This is my space. Um, but I wanted to, see like where else this could go. So I remember getting on stage and the singing definitely was not it. The acting definitely was not it. But um, the dancing, our music teacher was just like, yo Marquise, like you picked this up very quickly. You know what you're doing. Um, so from there, um, I really started to focus on dance. So for our eighth grade talent show, I recreated this routine from So You Think You Can Dance and was just like, oh, this is something I wanted to work on. But it was also with the fact that I wanted to prove my siblings wrong. So they always looked at me as like the golden child because I straight A's and Marquise always gets this right and blah, 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 blah. So I wanted to kind of prove to them like, nah, like I can do something that's not good. Um, but then I accidentally fell in love with dance. So I remember my eighth grade English teacher, Mr. Callback was like, that's the happiest I've ever seen you. Keep doing that and keep doing that. And um, I didn't stop. So went from there and ended up joining a dance crew and kept on with the musical theater stuff. So I did school show growing up. Um, and then I ended up going to college and I was nervous at first because I was like, all right, I'm gonna do this broadcasting thing and this is the thing that makes sense. But then I ended up studying abroad my freshman year of college and I went to the Czech Republic and studied theater. And in that space is really where I saw like theater for social justice and was just like, yo, this is a thing that I love to do. Why am I not doing this um, so much more often? And why, why is this not like a focus of what I do? Because I think there's a powerful aspect of storytelling. So theater, like you have to get to know this character. You have to know their why, you have to learn their history. You have to be able to tell their story all over again. And so for me, I was like, that is like the purest form of empathy because I now had to step into this person's shoes. And so from there, I was just like, oh, I wanna know more about this story. And I wanna know how we can have that visceral reaction that theater has. It takes you through this journey of the beginning, the middle, the end, you build a bond with this character in an hour or two hours. And was just like, oh, if that is a way that people can have empathy or learn about another person or learn about something 
that gives enough distance where it's just like, oh, this isn't reality. So I remember doing a show based in South Africa that was really focused on their apartheid called Sizwe Bonzi is Dead. And that was just so fascinating because afterwards we sat down and we talked with the audience of just like, yo, like, do you know what this means? Do you know why this is important? And they were just like, well, why did you make these acting choices or why did you play this character in a very certain way? So I think through theater and film, I got to learn who these people were, but I also got to tell a certain specific kind of history as well. So when we really get into the nitty gritty of like this creation and this storytelling, I think that's the um, important crux of a lot of things is how do you leave this world of the theater either challenging yourself to think about people in new ways, but then also saying like, oh, I just stepped into this thing and why is it not settling with me? So oftentimes theater, you want this pretty bow at the end of it, but I didn't, I chose to partake in plays that did not leave a pretty bow at the end. There were genres of violence, there were genres of racism, there were genres of separation, all these kind of things. So I really wanted to play into those roles specifically because I thought it was a conversation to be had, but I think it was also another aspect of getting to know a world that I was not as familiar with overall. <laughs> I actually started playing the cello out of laziness, so I had to pick between the cello and the saxophone, and I was just like, ah, do I gotta do like, I gotta stand up and play the sax? <laughs> Yikes, didn't wanna do that, so Young Keith was still very lazy. Um, but no, I think the cello always attracted me because uh, believe it or not, I was like super quiet as a kid. Um, was not loud. I took up the least amount of space because um, I was I middle child syndrome, whatever. Um, I just like, oh, well, how do I make the least amount of noise? So I remember picking up the cello and was just like, oh, this is is different. Like I was a smart kid. They knew me as a smart kid. Awesome. Quiet. Just stuck to my books. I was reading a lot. But the cello was the first time where I had to do something in front of an audience that was outside of academics. And so playing the cello, it gave me a sense of pride because it was something different. Not, um, I knew my older brother, he played the viola, my sister played the violin, they stopped that. Um, but I was like, I want something that I can commit to um, for me. And so I remember that's the time where I was just, you know, them drones sound trash. And when you first start, I was like, I'm like, <laughs> let me not do this. But I wanted to stick to it because I was just like, oh, they see potential in me. They see this is something I can do. But I learned to read a whole nother language. I learned to read music. I learned to like go into that. And that wasn't something typical that I saw a black kid doing. And I never saw that in like popular culture until I saw like the soloist with Jamie Foxx in it. And later on, I was like, oh, look, I did that. <laughs> but yeah, that was like a dope process because there was so much potential. But I think it's always like a bittersweet relationship I have with my cello as well, because as I started getting older, um, my love of theater and dance came into the space. Um, I stopped playing basketball for my cello, actually. But then even in high school, I was just like, ah, this is. But then it was also like it was an expensive fucking thing to get lessons for. So I was like, I didn't I had the lessons in school, but like everybody else was getting like these private lessons. So I remember going through like playing with playing the cello and stuff. And I knew there was a certain kind of potential I had there. But it also was it was raw talent. It wasn't necessarily like I was the most technical player. I wasn't this. It was nothing. I just knew like. My string had to be here. This sounded good. I can hit the rhythms. I can hit the accents. I knew exactly what to do. But there was still like that level of like, ah, there's st I'm still not what it is to be great. And I was like, I always felt slighted because of that. So like, I remember this prodigy essentially came in my senior year and it was just like, there's no point in me being here anymore. And so I was just like, if he does everything that you need him to do, then what's the point of me being here? So I remember like losing out on first chair to this like this child prodigy. And I was like, well, what the fuck? What is this? Like, <laughs> what's the point? So I remember that um, my relationship with the cello really changed differently because that's the first time in the creative space where I was just like, oh, he has a talent and he had the funds to get specific lessons. Like he essentially came out the womb playing the cello. So I was just like, Ah, like if this is what they're looking for, then I'm not it and I'm not going to give you the certain kind of space that you want. So I remember that really like took me away from wanting to play the cello anymore because I was just like, I didn't get first chair. I didn't do this. And it was a little bit of an ego thing. It was high school. But yeah, I think that's a certain spot where like creation, this thing that I was doing for nine and a half years just felt it was like for nothing. So I really like started delving into that theater space. It's really why um, I stuck with that a lot more. Body.
spirit committed to uh, resisting and committed to winning, whether it was Natty in Jamaica who fought uh, against uh, these enslavers, whether it was Harriet Tubman who helped to free uh, more than 700 slaves. I think I come from a, a very strong history, and I simply want to live on this planet and to continue that tradition and to try in my little way to make my ancestors proud. Um, education was, <laughs> it was my escape, uh, metaphorically and literally. Um, it was something I've always taken pride in. It was the world I can get into. I was always reading books. I was always trying to figure out more about the world. My favorite short growing up was house like that. <laughs> I was like, oh, let's think about philosophy. What is these words of life? What is this ethical thing that is happening um, in this space? And so I'm always, I was always drawn to like intellectuals. I was drawn to how can you create this entire freaking world out of nothing? And you created your own ethics, you created your own characters, you created this setting, like this story that went into everything. So thinking about that a little bit more, um, I was like, I know if there's one thing I'm good at, it's my damn academics. I know that's my escape. I know that's something I will succeed in. So I found myself, I, and this is something I'm still like even unlearning today, like, my worth and my identity was so tied into my academics. So I was just like, this is what I'm known for. This is what I'm good at. But even with that, that came from other things. That came from me knowing that um, academics was my only way out of a shitty situation at home. So I was just like, there, the stepfather was not doing what he needed to do. So in and out of jail, dealing with that, then drugs in and out of the house. So for me, I was just like, school was my safe haven for a lot of time. So I was just like, I need to figure out this space and know how to stay in there. So I was in clubs, I joined school shows, so I was, and I took all the AP classes possible um, in order to just not have to go home until like 9.30, 10 o'clock at night. I go to sleep, get up again at six in the morning, catch that bus at 6.55, 6.51 in the morning, go to orchestra, do that shit all over again, and I worked long hours on the weekend, but school was my way of escaping. And then it was when I got to go to college where that was like the ultimate escape. So in order to deal with all the trauma and shit at home, school was my opportunity to get out. I can't say the same, that was for my siblings and stuff. Like I'm the only one to go to like a four year college and go away from home. But while some of them stayed home and played the role of the protector of my mom and shit like that from um, step parents and stuff, it was definitely my way to make sense of the world and know that something else could happen that was a lot greater was uh, going to college. I just, yeah. And then even when I got to college, it was like that survivor's guilt because I had three meals a day. I had hot water. I had a bed that I didn't have share and all that kind of stuff. So I was just like, this is, I wonder how my siblings are doing all the time. So education, though it was an escape for me, it was also like, again, like a bittersweet relationship I had to it. But I think it was necessary for my growth. Yeah, yo, like that's the friend I, first time I was around white white people. Oh my goodness, like <laughs> <laughs> that was a culture shocker in myself. I said, so y'all didn't have to do your laundry at the age of eight and nine. Like that doesn't make sense to me. I'm confused. So I remember like my roommate definitely had his parent come through to do his laundry. And I said, this is weird. Um, but it was like that time where I was just like, these are things that I had to get done. Um, but it really opened me up to like this whole new world of people. I've never seen upper class folk move the way that they did. Um, I've never seen upper class black folk <laughs> at all. And that was like a whole nother world in itself. Cause I'm just like, nah, I'm definitely like very low income, very poor, like coming into college. And I was just happy to be there. But when I think about how it expanded my worldview is I got to hear philosophies that I've never heard before. Like I didn't know what the hell utilitarianism was. I didn't know what um, freaking Marxism was. I didn't know what these frameworks were. And so I remember getting to school and was just like, oh, I have to reckon with my blackness and educate myself around myself and my history and stuff. I didn't have the longevity or my mom didn't have the opportunity to teach me about like, oh, this is in history and these are things you have to worry about, blah, blah, blah. She was just like, you know, it's just stay away from the white people, like <laughs> awesome. But it was never no context to what that was and why that was a thing. 
Um, so when I got to college, that was when I had to really reckon with like, oh, this is Marquise the black person or some black was always that descriptor in the middle of it. And I was just happy to have made it out. Um, so when I got there, it was expanding my global perspective. And I think it was really when I got to study abroad in my first year, I took every opportunity possible to not have to go home. <laughs> and I was just like, all right, I got to college. I now get to study theater and history in the Czech Republic. So I learned about theater and violence, theater for social justice. And it was just like that moment right there, that global perspective brought me all the way back. So even when I was um, across, I remember um, a death happened in our hometown. And it was one of my little brother's close friends, Savon. He ended up getting shot in his car while I was abroad. And I used to play basketball with him. And so while I was also in the Czech Republic, there was this moment where we went to Brno and they sectioned off the black and brown kids, the um, gypsies is what they call them. They were Mo Romani children, but because they had the gypsy label, um, they put them off, sectioned them off into the ghetto. And I remember there were only three, two black people, including myself, and then one Latina girl that was on this trip with me. Um, and going there, and I just remember having like this very visceral reaction. I was just like, nah, this is weirdly familiar. Like, why is this familiar? And I was like, oh, this is me growing up and then also seeing like 98% of the Czech people would willingly not live next to Romani kids. I was just like, ah, this is, this is like a weird feeling. Um, so I remember just getting there and learning that and just seeing the advocacy that was done, but the theater that they were doing around that. And so that really changed my perspective on how I viewed America. And I was just like, my relationship to America and my relationship to race and privilege is so much more different now. And so that started to inform anything that I was creating moving forward, whether that was the shows and plays that I picked to study, the classes that I took, um, the dances that I created. I, it was always a storytelling aspect to it. So, yeah, I definitely was just like, nah, this is happening all over and I don't know how to fix it. Yo, I had, I had to learn. <laughs> the very thing that taught me to escape is the very thing that humbled me and brought me back to the realities of the space that I grew up in. Like normally from my day to day growing up, you're in the hood. So you're just like, all right, well, gunshots are normal. Uh, violence is normal. Oh, not coming from scarcity is normal. Like you make do out of what you have. And I think with that, I started, I, I call it like seven stages of blackness, but <laughs> you start to think about your history. Then you're just like, oh wait, this happened contextually. Oh, this is why my, I'm in the situation that I'm in. Oh, this is all of these layers of things that contributed to my very existence and why I moved the way that I did. So I think as I was learning more about myself, I was just like, ah, I have to do something about this because I was no longer satisfied. I was angry. I was frustrated. I was just like, this, this ain't right. So how do I change the world in a way that I knew how and education was one of those forms because I was like I got to study I read even more than I already did but then I was also critically thinking about the things that I was taking in at the same time so I think that's really where I had to learn about myself learn about my privileges learn about how I take up space but then also knowing like moving forward how can I make the world in a better space and do it in a way that affects the major a lot of people at the same time so yeah it's it's pivotal. I think everything that I've do, done, um, the podcast, um, Dear Reading, that was bred out of the fact that I got to Susquehanna and everybody's like, oh, you're from Reading, Pennsylvania? Like, are you over here outside of Reading or like you're actually in the city? And when they found out I went to Reading High, a lot of the response I got all the time was like, so you survived. How'd you survive? And that shit used to piss me off. I said, I know y'all are lying. I said, Reading is low key a gem. Like, <laughs> I think Reading has some of the nicest people ever. Like, because we're growing up around so many different kinds of people, um, I think it's so important for us to know. Like, I grew up around undocumented folks. I grew up around queer folk. I grew up around um, Mexican, Dominican, Puerto Rican, black people, white people. Like, we were all in this, but I just assumed we were all black, brown, and poor, and we were in this together. So <laughs> I didn't know any better. I didn't know that there was like, oh, there are so many different things going on. So 
Dear Reading was created out of frustration that people at Susquehanna did not think of our city as any more than the violence that was perpetuated by the Reading ego, by the local newspaper and shit like that. So I think that was really just like, how do we take back this very specific narrative? And then even this American Negro, it's very intentional about its purpose, like, which is now like the Rational Anger podcast, but it's very much so like bridging academia and the hood. Like there is still a privilege of me going to college and I acknowledge that because there's a level of information in a certain language that I'm not privy to that other people aren't. So how do I take this information and make it palatable to everybody? Because people in academia are doing research on people in the hood all the time, but now we're also not seeing like, as you do this research, what does this action actually look like behind it? So for me, I'm just like, I'm serving essentially, I'm using that podcast as a way to not only expand perspective, but then also, make information accessible and relatable. People in the barbershop are just saying the system's fucked up. People in college and academia want to say it's structural racism. We're going to dismantle white supremacy, patriarch capitalism. You can use all them big words, but we're just like, um, so what we're going to do is take all this shit down, right? So I think that's just the part of it. I wanted to be intentional about that work and what that meant. Um, and even events that I throw, like everything is done with intention. The locations that I choose, the people that I choose, the teams that I curate, um, everything is pretty much by design. So one of the bigger events I've done two years ago was called Here in My City. I purposely wanted to bring black and brown folk into the Gaga Works, which is a very white dominated space in terms of art, in terms of what they want to say is culture. Um, it was very much so intentional about disrupting that space. And I think it was important to disrupt that particular space because you have too much art you have too much culture you have too much of this to happen so any event that i'm doing it's very intentional about its purpose um, whether it's gonna figure out how to do some um internal work with black folk talking about like these ideals that people embody but don't realize they do because day to day we don't have time to think have that forward thought of being like oh well, maybe i might have been a little sexist in this comment or maybe i might have <laughs> perpetuated colorism in x y and z kind of way or anti-blackness or whatever but now we're bringing it to the community and engaging in those dialogues with people who have time to engage in those because that's not something we can talk about every day, right? So that's really why um, education is like at the forefront because it forces me to stay humble because that means I don't, I don't know everything. I'm learning all the time. I'm learning about how different people inform my politic. I'm learning about how these things all embody each other. So anything that I'm doing creatively is always going to be meant to challenge the status quo, disrupt something, but then also encourage people to want to learn more about X, Y, and Z kind of thing as, <laughs> yeah, we go through life. wild part it's, incor it's incorporated due to my blackness that's it's just very inherent like i think there's space for people who create who happen to be black which is awesome um and i think there's also space for those who are very intentional about their blackness i think it's difficult as a black creative to have to go around and then as you develop your platform and you develop your creation there is this space now of like what does it mean to be pro-black what does it mean to create black art <laughs> right um, but I think August Wilson, he was the epitome of creating characters who happen to be black. He was forcing you to have to explore the human condition, but through this exploration, you got to acknowledge somebody else's humanity. 
Whereas somebody like Susan Lori Parks, who was a feminine, black feminist playwright, she really focused on saying, no, these characters are very black. <laughs> we're going to talk about dismantling this idea of the welfare queen. And then we're also going to be talking about like, how do we explore this human condition, but know that it's still a work in progress. So where August Wilson's work really focused on like, here's the beginning, the middle of the end. Susan Lori Parks, there was no actual end because these ideas of tackling systems don't ever actually end. So for me, I think liberation is going to be inherent in the work that I do personally. But I think all black art is inherently didactic to non-black audiences because they don't share that cultural aspect. They don't know what a hot comb feels like on the side of their head. They don't know what it looks to get that that talk from a black mom real quick. They don't even know what the talk is. Like, I think that's the difference in our experiences very much so. And I think that's very intrinsic of the black experience. There's a very particular experience that we have. So now when we think about liberation, when we think about revolution, all of these things, my creation, me as an educator, this is always the through line of everything that I do. And I think if more people were very intentional about that, I think some people are accidentally, <laughs> I think some people are accidentally revolutionary. Um, I think some people accidentally disrupt these certain spaces and don't realize it. And then they get catapulted because now that you've done this thing, they're just like, this is the best thing in the world. And they want you to be the spokesperson for what does liberation look like. But I think those who are very much so, um, those who are very much so intentional about things, I think there's a space for both. But I sometimes I feel like in the black creative space, though liberation is a very key thing that's necessary, I don't want that pressure to be onto people who just simply want to create art because that's something that brings them passion. My art or project or creations are very much so focused on centering specifically the black trans women, but black people. And so I think that's important to build up from bottom up mostly. Yeah, nah, that is, um, this American Negro actually came from a James Baldwin speech. Um, but then it's also um, To the Mountain. That entire title, this title is based off Go Town on a Mountain. And um, James Baldwin is the first person that I felt like I related to in a book. Um, Cause Go Tell It On A Mountain, this kid is going through, um, he's trying to figure out what does religion mean? He's trying to figure out like, how does his world inform by all of his relationships and how they impacted. So though the character centered is John, but he has to learn why his parents' relationship is the way that it is with him. So in Go Tell It On A Mountain, he's not only giving you John's human condition, but now why his dad is responding to him or why his mom is responding to him the way that they do when they start giving these backstories. And I think that's perfect because it's a specific iceberg effect that I think Baldwin was able to capture, which is like, here is what this is, but now let me hold this mirror up to you as well. And I think that's what I want my work to do and have that kind of impact is James Baldwin had a way to speaking to black folk. There was also a pessimistic aspect to it. I think there was a real aspect to it. I think there was a a beauty in the language that he used, because I definitely prefer his essays over a lot of stuff. Like I think his le his ne letter to his nephew is one of the things I always recommend, is because he's now talking about, this is the black world that you are going to grow up in, and here's how you're going to have to navigate it because they only see you as such. But through that, now it's like, let's start pushing this a little bit more. Because not only was he holding white people to the fire, he was holding black folk too. And I think that's the important part sometimes as well is like, how do both of these worlds interact? And a lot of my works will forever center blackness. I really don't care how whiteness is gonna do that unless it's being like super violent, which is always is, but another story for another day. But I went like James Baldwin is a huge influence on that because his work to me always inspires what education is supposed to do, what liberation is supposed to do, inspire curiosity to reimagine a world that we were indoctrinated with. Yeah, uh, Nina Simone said it best when she was saying that your art should reflect the times. <laughs> August Wilson said all art is inherently political. I think it's important for my work to center black people is just because I think in 2016, 2015, 2016, at the rise of Black Lives Matter, you started seeing work that pandered to these movements. And I think that, yeah, this is fine. I think for when you're black explaining to people <laughs> who don't get this experience, these are awesome ways to do so. But when I am centering black folk, it is challenging us to always do better. I'm not perfect. I know I'm not perfect. My creations aren't gonna always be perfect, but I'm a work in progress. And I don't think a lot of people give themselves enough grace with that. So I want people to see 
like this love of learning that I have always. I think love of learning means that you always have to be in a space of humility. You always have to stay humble, but you're okay with exploring yourself. You're okay with exploring other humans, your relationships, your creations, um, any art that you interact with. I think that shit is so important. And so for me, when I think about centering black folk in a lot of my stuff, it's really just how do we ultimately just make sure that we are surviving? We're moving from a similar ideology and then also just knowing like the shit's for us. It's my good morning to niggas and niggas only, right? I think that is became such a, like a powerful thing for a lot of people because they're just like, you're acknowledging black people specifically. And that simple greeting is different. We see the good morning to niggas and niggas only is the head nod that we share on the when we're walking on the block, right? <laughs> I think that's important. So um, just really wanting to navigate whatever that looks like, but centering black folk is always gonna be the space. And I never want it to be a thing where I'm not speaking of the community anymore, because I think that's another spark, part of education and liber liberation work that tends to get missed. A lot of people like to tell you about what's going on in the hood. And I think that's the bougie part of academia, but they don't actually still live there or they don't actually they're not among the people anymore. They use them as research subjects and then they stop there. But I'm just like, how are you living amongst these people? How are you also staying authentic? So I think as I think about centering black people, it's also a way for me to stay consistent with myself at the same time. I think liberation means, whoa. Um, liberation is a sense of freedom. It's a sense of um, being able to not have, not be forced to, have blackness at the forefront you get to navigate in the world that you want all the time now you know black culture we lit however i think there's a space where we have to put that blackness in front of our humanity a lot of the times and like can i still be a black person and sit in my anger sit in my sadness sit in my frustration sit in these very real emotions that all humans feel that are is relatable to everybody and i want that to be a very free thing for everybody so that's what I think liberation starts to look like. I think liberation is me no longer walking and like checking over my back. It's not me being annoyed with every other colonizer that I have to come in contact with, right? Um, <laughs> it's these things that are very real that I don't think um, black folk are ever afforded the grace to just have to exist. It shouldn't be us um, stressing ourselves out into death. It shouldn't be us having to march and know that us marching in our mere presence is still, there's a chance of violence happening because we have to march for our lives and we have to say these certain things. I think that liberation is very much so allowing me to be able to think freely, but then also be able to navigate this world in a much different way. It's why I'm inspired by people like Rihanna does whatever the fuck she wants. I think Beyonce like completely has a whole nother aspect of where she's allowed to explore in a creativity and a freedom now that's not set by what does the white gaze look like anymore. I think Kirby Jean Raymond, who does Pierre Moss, he navigates in a world that's completely different, right? I think these people are so pivotal in these times because of the fact that their work centers black people now, but I think their work is also inherently disruptive. I think their work also allows us to open up these doors for the next generation. So when we do want to step into the stuff that we want to do, we have the freedom to do so and knowing that is good, right? I think liberation is when I get to just be around my people and create anything and also be allowed to be mediocre. I don't think we're allowed to be mediocre sometimes, right? So yeah, I think liberation is not black excellence in ourselves to death. <laughs> I think it's um, not stressing um, ourselves out to death. And I think it's gonna be a time where I know my ne niece and my nephew can roam around free and be actually get to be kids. Liberation looks like being able to stay a kid until you're 18. Like that's what liberation looks like to me at the end of the day. So I want all of my work to reflect this world, challenge people, but then also, I just want something to be left here that'll make the world a better place when I leave. So, yeah. Um, so once again, I'm Marquise Richards, Marquise Davon, this American Negro, whatever you want to call me. Um, and I'm gonna change the world by um, just inspiring the world to 
become a space where black kids can navigate freely and who they want to be and be okay with making mistakes. That's it.